So the unit circle, there is another way to talk about evaluating trigonometric functions of various angles. You can use right triangles, although not for every angle, because some angles you can't make a triangle where the not right angle is some other right angle. Um, but for most angles, we can use right triangles, but sometimes we can't. So the unit circle is a circle, big surprise, of radius one, meaning, right, the radius is one, and it's centered at the origin. And it looks like this. Do my best job to draw a circle. That's pretty good. And so knowing that the radius is one means we can already identify a few points. This point here on the positive x-axis is the point one comma zero. This point here on the positive y-axis is zero one. This point here on the x-axis is negative one zero. And this point down here is zero, negative one. But more generally, we would like to kind of talk about any point on the circle. So let's say we have some point, and we're just going to call it the point x comma y. And we're going to talk about the angle that this point, I should say, the segment from the origin to this point, makes with the positive x-axis. So the usual way of measuring the angle, right? We would say the angle from here to here is theta. That's the usual way we draw angles. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a perpendicular. And I want to, you to all observe or see that if this point is called x, y, it means I've gone over x and up y. So the base of the triangle has a length of x. And the height of the triangle has a length of y. And the hypotenuse of the triangle has a length of one because that's the same as the radius. So now we can find the other trig functions. But what I'm going to write before that is it's really important to note that any point on the circle, and I should specify, right, the circle is just these points around. It's not any of the inside stuff. That's called the disk. But the circle is just all these points on the boundary. Any point on the circle has an x, y coordinate, but that is going to be equal to, as we're going to see in a minute, cosine theta comma sine theta. So that coordinate right there the x coordinate is cosine of theta, and the y coordinate is sine of theta. And here's how we can see it. Well, I mean, look, there's a right triangle. I know how to find sine of theta. Sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is y over one. But that's just y. And cosine of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is x over one, but that's just x. And tangent of theta is the opposite over adjacent. And the reciprocals we know how to do. Cosecant theta is the reciprocal of sine, so that's going to be 1 over y. Secant of theta is the reciprocal of x, so that's going to be 1 over x. Sorry, the reciprocal of cosine, which is 1 over x. And cotangent theta is going to be the reciprocal of tangent, which is going to be x over y. So this is how we often talk about the trigonometric functions on the unit circle. So instead of saying in a right triangle that sine is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse, alternatively, we can say on the unit circle, sine of the angle is just the y coordinate that hits the circle. It's also convenient. Is it the way I do it? Not really, to be honest. So I should say, it's not the way I do it with the exception of quadrantal angles. For quadrantal angles, meaning 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or pi over two radians, pi radians, for these angles that end up on one of the axes, I definitely use this method to find sine and cosine and tangent and so on. Okay, so 
Um, yeah, and I think I want to just, so I could draw the union circle for you and that would take some time and you would all see a thing eventually, but I could just show you the union circle. So I think I'm going to do that instead. So let me show you the unit circle. It's also very Googleable, as I'm sure you're aware. So here is the unit circle. And the angles are a little hard to see on there, I will admit. Let me kind of write them in a little better. But here's what I want to point out. We know that sine of pi over six is one half, and the sine of pi over six is root three over two. This is just another way of seeing it. We know that for pi over four, cosine is one over root two and sine is one over root two. You might want to rationalize those. And for pi over three, cosine is one half, sine is root three over two. One thing I want to make sure everyone's clear is that in this, way of doing it when you're talking about the coordinates of the point on the circle, cosine is always the x coordinate, sine is always the y coordinate. One way I've reminded myself of this is that it's alphabetical. When you're writing coordinates, x always comes before y, and alphabetically, cosine always comes before sine. So that's an easy way to remember, oh yeah, cosine first, sine second, x first, y second. Um, and then the other thing I really want to point out here before we kind of move on is, look how all the angles with the same reference angle. I don't like the way they do their fours on this, that's fine. So pi over three, two pi over three, four pi over three, and five pi over three, all of those angles have the same x and y coordinates except for the positive or negative sign. Right? Each of these have one half comma root three over two. It's just that here, the x coordinate's negative. Down here, they're both negative. Down here, the y coordinate's negative. But having the same reference angle means the sine and cosine and all the rest of the trig functions have the same values, just maybe not the same signs. S I G N, right? It's really too bad that the trig function sine and the word S I G N sign sound the same. It can be a little confusing sometimes. But for all these, all these angles with the same reference angle, the trig functions have the same values up to a sign. It's a true for pi over six, right? Pi over six, the reference angle five pi over six, the reference angle, sorry, the angle, not the reference angle. Five pi over six has a reference angle of pi over six. Seven pi over six has a reference angle of pi over six. And 11 pi over six has a reference angle of pi over six. All of those angles have trig functions that have the same values except maybe not the right sign. And the same is also true for all the angles that have pi over four as a reference angle. Some people, not me, like to memorize all of this. I do not. If you were gonna memorize any of it, I would encourage you to memorize the first quadrant's worth. And then, for the other quadrants, you can use the tricks we've already talked about. How we know in the second quadrant, sine is positive, the other two are negative. How in the third quadrant, tangent's positive, and the other two are negative. And how in the fourth quadrant, cosine's positive, and the other two are negative. So that's kind of what I would do. But if you prefer to memorize the whole thing, that is also perfectly fine. But what I will say generally is you do want to get to a point where you're not having to spend too much time thinking about what sine of seven pi over six is. When I do sine of seven pi over six, I'm like, okay, sine of pi over six is one half. We're in the third quadrant, so sine of seven pi over six must be negative one half. That's kind of my general thought process for finding a trig function of an angle, a special angle. And then, so what I should say here before I go away is, you could memorize this and then just know things like, so I'm gonna move this away a little bit. But I'm gonna say like, I could just use this to say, all right, you can see all that, yeah. I could say, well, clearly cosine of five pi over six is, well, there's five pi over six, cosine is the X value, it's negative root three over two. Or sine of, I've kind of 
cut off the bottom part here. Sine of, can you still see that? Yeah, you can still see that. Sine of, uh, maybe. We're getting kind of low there, I don't know. Sine of four pi over three is also negative root three over three. Because looking at that angle, the y value, the y coordinate is negative root three over two. When you get to the tangent and other things, it becomes a little work. Like if I want to find tangent of say, I don't know, three pi over four, I could write it out as the y value over the x value. I think that's more work than I want to do. I can say tangent three pi over four is y one over root two over x negative one over root two. Seems kind of silly. I know it's negative one because I know that those are the same, just opposite values. Um, so that's a perfectly fine way to evaluate any trig function ever, right? You could also do, I'm sticking to the second quadrant just because it's easier not to cover it up. If I wanted to find say secant of two pi over three, I would say, well, secant is one over the X coordinate and the X coordinate is gonna be negative one half. And one divided by negative one half is negative two. I will emphasize here, this is not the method I would recommend. It's perfectly fine. If you like it, that's great. You should do it the way you like to do it. But I would, I would still recommend to everybody to do it the way we were doing it yesterday, to think about the reference angle, to think about the quadrant you're in, and then use our knowledge of the special triangles to figure out what sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, co, cosecant, secant, and cotangent are. So for example, I know we've already talked about this, but I'm just going to say once more. If I was trying to find, say, cosine of five pi over six, I wouldn't really think about what the coordinate was on the unit circle. I don't really have it memorized. I would instead say, okay, reference angle, pi over six. Quadrant, two. Triangle, if you want to draw it, pi over six is the smaller angle. So the side opposite it is one. We know the hypotenuse is two, and we know the other side is root three. So cosine of five pi over six is gonna be something like root three over two. But we know we're in quadrant two, so we know cosine has to be negative because sine is the one that's positive in quadrant two. And that's what we get. That to me is kind of the fastest way to do it. it or maybe, maybe not fastest, but the most efficient. Um, and similarly, excuse me, sorry. We could find tangent of three pi over four in the same way. We'd say, okay, reference angle is pi over four. We're also in quadrant two. We know the triangle there. You don't have to draw the triangle. I'm just drawing the triangle to make sure everyone remembers what it looks like. But if you like, yeah, I know these triangles, James, I don't need to draw them, it's perfectly fine. So tangent of three pi over four is gonna be negative because we're in quadrant two, one over one, which is just one. So this is still the way I would encourage you all to evaluate most trig functions, specifically trig functions of angles whose reference angles are special angles. So anything that's a something pi over six, a something pi over three, or a something pi over four. Or in degrees, anything whose reference angle is 30 degrees, 45 degrees, or 60 degrees. Any questions before we keep going? The real kind of, the real kind of sum up to the story here is that we want you to be able to evaluate trig functions of these angles as quickly as you can, because they're gonna come up frequently enough that you don't wanna be spending your time having to punch into a calculator or look up, but it's also for some of these punching them into a calculator is not gonna be super great. Like I have a calculator, one of the calculator, many, many calculators that I have. One of them, if you do like, cosine of pi over six, it'll tell you it's root three over two. But other calculators, if you do cosine of pi over six, it'll tell you it's 0.866. And your teachers aren't gonna wanna see 0.866. They'll be like, oh, they used a the calculator. They didn't really know what we were looking for. So 
that's what I'm trying to get at is you want to be able to know what these are because they're going to come up. I feel like I'm overselling how often they come up. They do come up, maybe not quite as often as I'm pretending like they do, but definitely often enough. Um, yeah, okay, so more importantly, maybe not more importantly, but more importantly, it's definitely important, maybe not more. Um, the unit circle enables us to evaluate trigonometric functions of quadrantal angles. Which again, I love to say, it's a great word. Sorry, there's a comma there. Just by using the X and Y coordinates. And they're kind of super easy. So for example, I would love to find, maybe not love, I would enjoy finding, I would like to find, find the six trig functions of, let's even do it in degrees just for fun, theta equal to 90 degrees. So I'm gonna draw the unit circle. I'm gonna draw the very, very abbreviated unit circle. There's my unit circle. And I usually on my unit circle like to put these four points on it. I kind of terribly call them the four corners of the unit circle. Yes, I know circles don't have corners, but it's easier than saying anything else. So I always label the four corners of the unit circle. And then we can also label the angles. This angle here is zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees. Now, really I've done too much work here. All we really needed to label was this one up here because that's the angle we're being asked about. So now let's go ahead and find all the things. And I'll refer you back just for one second to this. We're just gonna say sine of 90 degrees is equal to the Y coordinate. Cosine of 90 degrees is equal to the X coordinate and so on and so on and so on and so on. So sine of 90 degrees, is the y coordinate at that point, which is one. Cosine of 90 degrees is the x coordinate, which is zero. Tangent of 90 degrees is dangerous. So I don't really want to write it's equal to one over zero, but I will. But we know, or maybe we don't, but you're about to hear if you haven't heard before, dividing by zero is undefined. Right? Zero goes into one, literally as many times as you want it to, and there's still leftovers. So instead of saying tangent of 90 equals one over zero, what I like to say is tangent of 90 degrees. We could write out the words is undefined. It's kind of lengthy. Usually what people do is they say tangent of 90 degrees does not exist. And it's not really important, but I don't like to write equals does not exist because it doesn't really equal not existing. It just doesn't exist. So you don't need an equal sign there. In fact, I'd prefer you not to put one there, but if you do, I won't like, I won't be a jerk about it, right? It's okay if you say equals does not exist, but really we just say tangent of 90 degrees doesn't exist. And now let's do the reciprocals. Cosecant of 90 degrees is the reciprocal of one, which is one over one. Or you could say it's one over the y coordinate, which is one over one. Secant of 90 degrees is the reciprocal of cosine, which is going to be one over zero. Oh, wait, that's another does not exist. And cotangent of 90 degrees is the reciprocal of tangent, which is, well, tangent was one over zero. So cotangent is going to be the flip, which is zero over one. And zero divided by one is zero. One goes into zero exactly zero times. 
And why don't I say anything else about that? I don't think so. Yeah, let's do one more example and then I'll say a thing. Ha, ah, ah. <laughs> uh, the lights always go out. I know it's it's ridiculous. Okay. Again, stop me if you have questions, write something in the chat, say a word. Well, let's do one more example. Let's say I want to find the six trig functions. In fact, maybe I'm gonna have you guys find the six trig functions of beta equal to pi. So again, I'm not gonna even draw the full abbreviated unit circle. I'm just saying, here's my unit circle. I'm looking at this point here because the angle over here is pi. And the point over there is the X coordinates negative one, the Y coordinate zero. So I would like you guys, sorry, you all, I'm trying not to say you guys so much because I know that we're not all guys, but it's a force of habit that I'm trying to break. So forgive me if it's if it doesn't sound excellent because I feel I hear it and I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible. So anyway, I would like for you all to find sine of theta, cosine of theta, tangent of theta, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I will tell you, two of them are gonna not exist. And two of them are gonna be zero and two of them are gonna be negative one. All right, so hopefully that was enough time. If it wasn't, it's also okay. So sine of theta is the y coordinate, that's gonna be zero. Cosine theta is the x coordinate, which is negative one. Tangent theta is y divided by x. By the way, this is one of the reasons we write sine, then cosine, then tangent. Because you can just say, oh, tangent is sine over cosine, which is zero over negative one, which is zero. And then cosecant is gonna be one over zero, which means it does not exist. It's a zero, not a six. Secant of theta is going to be one over negative one, which is negative one. And cotangent theta is going to be negative one over zero, which also does not exist. That's kind of it. Where'd you go? Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So here's what I want to say about the six trig functions of any quadrantal angle. And again, that's an angle that's just ending up on one of the axes, either somewhere on the x-axis or somewhere on the y-axis. For any quadrantal angle. And so again, those are oops, ang not angles, angle. So those are angles like zero, pi over two, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. The list goes on. Or in radians, sorry, or in degrees, 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees. Any angle that's a multiple of 90 degrees is a quadrantal angle. The following things are always going to be true. Either sine or cosine. will be zero, right? Because if you're at one of those four points, one of the coordinates is zero, either X or Y. And the other will be either positive or negative one. So if one of them is one, the other one is zero. If one of them is zero, the other one is either one or negative one, depending on what side of things are on. And then 
either secant or cosecant. Well, since secant and cosecant are the reciprocals of cosine and sine, if one of sine or cosine has to be zero, one of secant or cosecant has to be the reciprocal of zero, which is undefined. So either secant or cosecant will be undefined. And the other will be plus or minus one. And lastly, either tangent or cotangent will be zero and the other will be undefined. This makes sense if we go back and look at how the trig functions are defined. I'm gonna cover this up for just a second, but we'll uncover it in a minute. So if you look at this, right, of these four trig functions, two of them have X in the denominator and two of them have Y in the denominator. So if Y ends up being zero, these two will be undefined. If X ends up being zero, these two will be undefined. That's kind of the whole, it's a much faster way of saying what I just said in a lot of words. So what I usually look for when I'm finding the six trig functions of a quadrantal angle is the following. Two zeros, two either plus ones or negative ones, and two undefines. That's always gonna be what happens when you find the six trig functions of any quadrantal angle. For sure, 100%, no doubt about it. Done that first. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's do one more just to kind of drive. It. So let's find the six trig functions of theta equal to 11 pi over two. Ooh, 11 pi over two, that's bigger than two pi. That's a lot more than two pi. So here's what I want to point out. Every revolution is two pi. So that means this angle here could be zero or two pi or four pi or any even multiple of pi. And this side over here could be pi, but it'd also be pi plus two pi, which is three pi or five pi or any odd multiple of pi. And then at the top and bottom, so I'm gonna kind of do this here. we have the pi over two. So we have like pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, seven pi over two, et cetera. Every other one is on the top. And all the other ones are on the bottom. So the top ones are, pi over two, three pi, sorry, five pi over two, nine pi over two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the bottom ones are three pi over two, seven pi over two, 11 pi over two. So 11 pi over two is gonna end up being where I like to say is the bottom of the circle. Well, great, we know that point, it's zero negative one. So then we can find everything. Sine of 11 pi over two is the y coordinate. Cosine of 11 pi over two is the x-coordinate. Tangent of 11 pi over two being y divided by x is gonna be undefined. So it does not exist. Cosecant of 11 pi over two, the reciprocal of negative one is negative one. Secant of 11 pi over two, the reciprocal of zero is undefined. And finally, cotangent of 11 pi over two. It's kind of weird and not exactly right to say the reciprocal of being undefined is zero. I would rather say cotangent is x over y, the x coordinate zero, the y coordinate's negative one. 
and zero divided by anything, sorry, zero divided by any non-zero number is zero. Negative one goes into zero, zero times. Okay. So, how much time have we got? Not a lot, all right. So that's kind of the whole story of quadrantal angles. You can find the six trig functions of them just by looking at the coordinate on the unit circle. And it's gonna have an X coordinate that's either zero or plus or minus one. And the Y coordinate will be the other, right? If X is zero, Y will be plus or minus one. If X is plus or minus one, Y will be zero. There are also some trigonometric identities. And identity is just something that is always true. So let's go ahead and look at our kind of very general unit circle again. Where this point here, x comma y is equal to cosine theta, sine theta. This angle is theta. This is x, this is y. So we have some what are called quotient identities. And these are things that we've already kind of alluded to and that you might already know are true. So, I can, yeah. So cosecant theta being one over y is equal to one over sine theta. Yeah, I gotta write them all down, sorry. I know so sine theta is y, cosine theta is x, tangent theta is y over x, cosecant theta is one over y, Secant theta is one over x, cotangent theta is x over y. This is something we've already said. I've said it a lot of times that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. Now we're just explicitly writing it out. And equivalently, sine of theta is the reciprocal of cosecant. The same thing is true for secant and, co and, and cosine. Secant of theta is the reciprocal of cosine, and cosine of theta is the reciprocal of secant. And we also have it for tangent and cotangent. Cotangent of theta is the reciprocal of tangent, and tangent of theta is the reciprocal of cotangent. And then maybe most importantly of all of these is that tangent of theta is equal to sine theta over cosine theta. And cotangent of theta is equal to cosine theta over sine theta. These quotient identities, which are just fractions, right? Saying how things work as fractions, these come up all the time. Often when I'm doing something with tangent, I immediately rewrite it as sine over cosine. It's kind of just a go-to thing to do. So these are definitely important. And then it is also true, ah, come on paper. We also have some, what are called Pythagorean identities. So in this same picture, We have a right triangle there. This hypotenuse is one. So it is definitely true that x squared plus y squared equals one squared. But one squared is just one. So I could really write this as x squared plus y squared equals one. And now I'm gonna replace x and y with their corresponding trig function. X is cosine of theta. Y is sine of theta. So cosine of theta quantity squared plus sine of theta quantity squared equals one. Um, I should point out that we do have an abbreviated notation for a power of a trig function. Instead of saying cosine theta quantity squared, we like to rewrite this or abbreviate it as cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta. 
those mean the same thing. Um, I should also mention the just over on the side here. Yeah, do I have room? Yeah, sure. Cosine squared theta equal to cosine theta quantity squared, not equal to cosine of theta squared. Right here, you're squaring the angle and then taking cosine of it. Here, you're taking cosine of the angle and then squaring the result. So totally different thing. So this is what I like to call everyone's favorite trick of the week. It's maybe not really your favorite trick of the week, but it's certainly the most popular. It's the most famous trick of the week, probably of all of them. And then sometimes people prefer to write it as sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equal to one. And there's a couple alternate forms. We can write sine squared theta equal to one minus cosine squared theta. And we can also write cosine squared theta equal to one minus sine squared theta. But really, if you know this one, you know all the rest of them. We're just moving things around. Um, and then we could answer the kind of question, I want to verify this trig identity. for, what have I got here? Theta equal to pi over six. Verify this. I mean, really they're all the same again, but we'll do it that way. So all that means is if someone says to verify something for a particular value, you're just gonna stick that value into the equation and hope that both sides are the same. So I'm not gonna start off by saying it's equal to one. I'm just gonna start off with saying, okay, I've got the left side. So the left-hand side, is going to be cosine squared of pi over six plus sine squared of pi over six. And I'm not yet sure that it's actually equal to one. So then I'm going to actually figure it out. So let's see, cosine of pi over six is the square root of three over two. So this is the square root of three over two quantity squared. Sine of pi over six is one half. So this is one half quantity squared. And then root three over two squared is three over four. And one half squared is one over four. And three fourths plus one fourth is one. So it is verified, right? We got it. It was equal to what it was supposed to be equal to. Um, there are two other Pythagorean trig identities. Ah, my thumbs will work. I should say, there's two other well-known Pythagorean trig identities, um, and they're the following. So if you take, I should say, if you divide sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equal to one by sine squared theta, let's see what we get. Sine squared theta over sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta over sine squared theta equal to one over sine squared theta. Well, sine squared theta divided by sine squared theta is just one. Cosine theta over sine theta is cotangent theta. So this is gonna be cotangent squared theta. And one over sine squared is one over sine quantity squared, which is cosecant squared theta. This is probably the less well-known of the two, but it is a trig identity. When I used to work in Colorado Springs, Colorado, one of my students made up the um, mnemonic device, I sleep on a cot in Colorado Springs, Colorado. It's not the best, but it was memorable. The next one's much more memorable. So the other one we have is divide the same thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the order just slightly. Divide cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equal to one by cosine squared theta. And here's what we get. Cosine squared theta divided by cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta divided by cosine squared theta equal to one divided by cosine squared theta. Or one plus sine over cosine is tangent. So sine squared over cosine squared is tangent squared theta. And one over cosine theta is secant theta. So one over cosine squared theta is secant squared theta. 
and forgive me for this because you'll never forget it. But one of my students, I didn't, I didn't come up with this. One of my students told me, oh yeah, I tan and get sexy. That's how they remember it. I tan and get sexy. Not me personally, because I don't tan, I burn. But it's hard to forget. It's burned into my memory for sure. Um, so yeah. And then, how much time? Okay. I will say, actually, I don't want to say that yet. So kind of one of the last things we do, not one of the last things. I know, right? Yes, I know. I tend to get sexy. It's, it's great. Um, what we often do with these trig identities is we want to be able to simplify trigonometric expressions. So for example, I want to simplify the following to one trigonometric term. Or it might just simplify to a number. Well, let's look at the following. Let's say we have, say for example, sine of theta times one plus cotangent squared theta. There's a couple ways to go here. We could say, oh, I know that one plus cotangent squared, that is equal to cosecant squared theta. So one direction we could do this is, oh, that's sine of theta times cosecant squared theta. But then cosecant squared theta is the reciprocal of sine squared theta. And then we can write this as one fraction, right? If you want, you can say that's sine of theta over one. And then we can just make the sine times one over one times sine squared. And then we can cancel a sine. Cancel a sine there and a sine there and get one over sine theta, which I would write as cosecant theta. So this kind of complicated, oh, sorry, that's a little weird. This kind of complicated just looking thing actually simplifies way down to cosecant theta. That's kind of, and there are times in future classes where you're gonna have something that's possibly really trigonometrically complicated and it's gonna make it really, really easier to deal with if you simplify it before trying to do anything else with it. Let's look at at least one more example. So let's look at say, sine of, oops, sine of alpha times tangent of alpha plus cotangent of alpha. So here, I didn't really need to put the alpha in parentheses, but I did. I could distribute sine of alpha to each of those terms, but I don't think that's where I want to start because it's not really going to be helpful to see sine of alpha times tangent of alpha plus sine of alpha times cotangent of alpha. What I think I would rather do is add these together by getting a common denominator. Here's what I mean. I'm going to rewrite this as sine of alpha times tangent of alpha, which is sine of alpha over cosine of alpha using that quotient identity. And cotangent of alpha is cosine of alpha over sine of alpha. And then to get a common denominator for these two, I'm gonna multiply this one by sine of alpha over sine of alpha, and this one by cosine of alpha over cosine of alpha. So that now I have, sine of alpha on the outside times, sine times sine is sine squared of alpha, and cosine times sine is just cosine times sine, so cosine of alpha times sine of alpha. Plus, here I have cosine squared alpha over sine of alpha times cosine of alpha. But now I have a common denominator, so I can actually put those together and rewrite this as, sine of alpha times one fraction. The denominator is cosine of alpha times sine of alpha. And the numerator is, well, I'm gonna write sine squared of alpha plus cosine squared of alpha. But you all know that the numerator is really equal to what? Equal to one. Exactly, yes, it's exactly equal to one. So this is really just sine of alpha times one over 
cosine alpha times sine of alpha. And then the sine here can cancel with the sine there. And we end up with one over cosine of alpha, which is secant of alpha. And I guess we're out of time, so I should probably stop. Um, I will say there is one more example, actually two, but one, the last one's not really great. There's one more example of this in the old notes that are on campus. So if you want another example, there is another example in there. And yeah, that's kind of all I have to say. I mean, all I, have, I could talk forever if you let me, but we're out of time. So I should stop talking.